Welcome everyone. I'm Sarah Ray from the Bloomfield Public Library. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have Sahara back and today we are talking about grave robbing. Sahara, all yours. Hello everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for having me back, Sarah. My name is Sahara Ferugio. I'm a licensed funeral director and I've been one for about eight years now. Um, I own Smart Funeral Planning, which is a local Connecticut company that helps people review the options and pricing for final arrangements well ahead of a death so that you can get things in order for your survivors for when the time comes. But today, obviously, we are here to learn a bit more about the history of grave robbing. So give me a moment and I will share my screen. Thumbs up if we could see the screen. Awesome. Okay, so thank you again for having me. I hope that everyone in attendance enjoys today's program. Although enjoy may not be the precise word, <laughs> let me rephrase it. I hope that you find this program interesting. So the years that we are speaking about today are from who knows to 1879. Um, I recently watched a documentary that uh, discovered close relatives to homo sapiens, so not quite humans, but of the homo species. That, and they had found that this species was one of the few uncovered species that also buries their dead. So I say who knows because it's completely undetermined how long humans or other species have been burying and likely unburying the remains. So from who knows to 1879 is what we're talking about today. And then we will talk a bit about modern uh, body donations and what that means. But there was a problem back then, and here it is. So the medical and even the embalming professions were expanded by leaps and bounds during this time. And the public demand for learned people to have a working knowledge of human anatomy was also expanding by leaps and bounds. However, with all these expectations, the public and primarily the church, both the Protestant and the Roman Catholic Church, found the idea of human dissection absolutely abhorrent. Given this awkward situation, both the medical and the embalming professions turned to the ruffians of any community to secure the much needed anatomical specimens, aka dead bodies. They turned to people who would rob graves for a fee. It is interesting to note that the issue of grave robbing is subject to much per perception and relativization. For if a grave is pilfered shortly after a death, it's a crime called grave robbing, and you can go to prison. But if a grave is pilfered 3,000 years after death, it is called archaeology and you can go on a National Geographic special. Just something to think about, folks. So let's get started with telling this story, and here we go. So this is a photo of Pope Boniface VIII. The Christian church absolutely forbade human dissection. So as you can imagine, uh, the idea of human dissection probably instinctually turns people off straight off the bat. Uh, before you consider the important purposes for which we would need to do the dissections. Uh, but the Roman Catholic Church strictly forbade both dissection and also cremation. Today that has changed, but back then, completely forbade. And in 1299, Pope Boniface VIII, seen here in this image, formally prohibited dissection. The church's stance against any violation of the human body was seen strictly as the temple of the Lord and was further reinforced in 1886 when Pope Leo VIII issued his canon law and the old 1917 code of canon law number 1203 read to every Roman Catholic on the face of the earth that the bodies of the faithful must be buried, cremation is prohibited, the faithful also are not allowed to join cremation societies whose purpose is to deny the bodily resurrection of the body. Okay. So it soon became clear that there was a collision course happening. 
uh, because the strict rules of the church and the demand for dead human bodies, which were needed for dissection, uh, they needed to find a solution. So since no one could legally or morally at that time donate a dead body to a school, the profession of the resurrectionists, as they were called, became a reality with disastrous consequences, I might add, and you soon shall see. However, before we get to that, let's review a short history of the development of human anatomy. And this, if you're interested, is actually a subject that we learn in funeral school, history of anatomy. So this is the father of anatomy, Claudius Galen. For thousands of years, human beings had absolutely no idea of how the human body worked. None at all. In fact, the earliest notion that something inside our bodies was actually doing something besides reproducing was the idea that the seat of feelings and learning was not in the brain, but was located in the heart. The first scientist to shake the anatomy tree is the man seen here, Claudius Galen. Galen is credited with being the father of anatomy, and his pioneering work formed a precious monument for ancient medicine. So this here is from 1513, uh, what that gentleman had drawn for a heart diagram. So as seen here, this is Galen's anatomical diagram, and it's not too far off from the mark. You could see that he did recognize the four chambers um, and the left and the right ventricles. This is his first etching of his examination of the structure of the human heart. And this is an early attempt at human anatomical structure. Following Galen's work, a number of forward-thinking people took on the task of anatomically documenting the structures of the human body. One of the foremost anatomists of his day was none other than Leonardo da Vinci. So you may know him as an artist, but he did so much very more than so much more than that. Da Vinci was a frequent visitor to the morgues of his time, and it is today estimated that he prepared over 750 anatomical specimens using his own embalming techniques, which have long been lost to history. Other names which appear in anatomical history are today totally forgotten, such as the Dutch physicians Swammerdam, Ruysch, and de Bills, whose crude anatomical diagram is seen in this image. However, it was not until the Englishman, John Hunter, came on the scene that human anatomy and the need for cadavers became vitally important. So this is John Hunter. Um, John Hunter was a notable physician and a lecturer on anatomy. Hunter initiated the Anatomical Museum at the College of Surgeons in London. And this is where Hunter ran into the Irish giant John Byrne. Byrne was over eight feet tall. He earned a good livelihood by exhibiting himself in London, but he had a bad constitution, and it was evident to all that he would not live to a very old age. In any case, Byrne was a great interest to Hunter. Not Byrne the living person, but Byrne's bones. Hunter wanted the bones for his medical museum. Boldly, Hunter approached the Irish giant Byrne and offered him the whopping sum of 800 pounds <coughs> on the understanding that Hunter should have Byrne's bones upon his death. Excuse me. The giant was seized with a feeling of indescribable horror, and he refused him. Dr. Hunter. Hunter persisted and tormented Burns so much that the giant made his trustworthy friends promise him on their oath that upon his death they would drop his body. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm going to have to make some tea. So he made his friends promise him that upon his death, they would drop his body weighted with lead into the sea while out from land. 
I'm going to grab some more water, guys. So sorry. 30 second break. Hydration break. Okay, I think I'm gonna survive. So Dr. Hunter wanted those big bones. <clears throat> the giant refused. He made his friends promise that when he died, they'd drop his weighted body with lead into the sea well far from land. However, <coughs> I don't know if we're gonna make it. However, Dr. Hunter was not to be deterred. Upon Burns' death, Dr. Hunter enticed the trustworthy friends to accept 500 pounds <coughs> for Burns' bones. The trustworthy friends readily accepted the offer. Hunter made 300 pounds on the deal and got the bones to boot. So much for giving burial instructions to trusty friends. Always pre-plan yourself, guys. Okay. So due largely to the work of Dr. John Hunter in London, the medical school across England and Scotland began to do most anything to get anatomical specimens for their anatomy labs to utilize. <laughs> and with this demand, the resurrectionist went haywire and nowhere did they cross the line with more tragic consequences than in Edinburgh, Scotland. The School of Surgery in Edinburgh was in a particularly flourishing condition and was held in very high repute during this period of history. Somehow, the medical school was being kept abundantly supplied with bodies for dissection. And one particular... <laughs> An anatomist named Dr. Robert Knox was particularly known for never being at a loss for cadavers. What the townspeople of Edinburgh did not know, but would soon find out, was that the highly esteemed Dr. Knox was in cahoots with two notorious thugs named William Burke and William Hare. Burke and Hare lived with their wives in one of the most miserable quarters of Edinburgh in a dark and filthy alley. In November of 1827, Burke and Hare began their professional work as grave robbers quite by accident. They found an old man by the last name of Donald who had dropped dead on a public street in Edinburgh. It was very late at night, and Burke and Hare, both drunk, stumbled on Donald and decided to take his body to the medical school. <coughs> this is one for the books, guys. Okay. In one hour, they had seven pounds in their pockets. It was the easiest money they had ever made. Their career path was set. In short order, Burke and Hare had perfected the art of grave robbing. And at their trials, they both boasted with great bravado that they could get a body out of the grave into a gunny sack and over the cemetery wall in 20 minutes. Dr. Knox had his supply of bodies. Burke and Hare had their supply of booze. A classic win-win situation. Until... I think you guys can see what's coming here this is the crime of the century 
by 18 move this thing here by 1828, one year into Burke and Hare's profitable enterprise, the good citizens of Edinburgh began to notice mysterious disappearances of the down and out locals. The truth was much, much more brutal. People were not simply vanishing because they had died. They were vanishing now because good old Burke and Hare had put their minds together and concluded that digging up bodies was very difficult, it was very hard labor, and was worst of all, very dirty. To this end, Burke and Hare invented a new method of getting Dr. Knox bodies. On foggy evenings, they would roam about the low quarters of the city and select a suitable down-and-out victim. <laughs> they would engage the hopeless person in conversation, take them to their quarters, get the person drunk. Burke, who had a fine voice, would begin to sing, and as soon as they're guest was drunk enough, Hare would pass behind the person and suffocate them by shutting their mouths and nostrils with his hands while Burke sat on the victim's chest. In the end, Burke and Hare had killed a mother and daughter who were very popular, and finally they killed an old woman and her grandson. Enough was enough, and with the little police work, Burke and Hare were quickly found out. Digging up graves had been bad enough, but with murder now added in the mix, there were new terrors. In time, Burke and Hare slipped up, and they were both arrested. Hare quickly squealed on Burke and turned on his former partner in crime. <coughs> they both said that they had taken all their work to Dr. Knox. Instead of going to the cemeteries to disinter dead bodies with great di difficulty, They had taken to manufacturing the corpses in which they dealt. As Hare commented in court, this was much easier to do. So, the people demanded a public execution. On January 28th, 1829, Burke was hanged in the presence of an enormous crowd. As Burke arrived on the platform of the scaffold, his composure left him amid the jeers, the curses, and the taunts of the assembled multitude. Defiant cries of hang hair too, or where is hair, and hang Dr. Knox, <clears throat> were mingled with curses against Burke. In an interesting twist of fate, the Scottish courts ordered that Burke's body be publicly dissected as additional punishment. William Hare escaped the hangman, but ended up blind and a beggar on the streets of London. So I guess he didn't have too good a fate himself. So for Dr. Robert Knox, <clears throat> while the Enterprise Burke and Hare episode had also destroyed the career and life of the famous anatomist, Dr. Robert Knox. Dr. Knox was a great, strong, outstanding, and valiant citizen and leader in Edinburgh. He was eloquent and most versatile in the classroom, and he was well considered as one of the most thorough teachers of anatomy that Scotland, a country which long had been noted for excellence in its anatomical instruction, had ever produced. However, by the end of the Burke and Hare mess, Dr. Knox had his name and life wrecked, ruined, and he remained embittered and died in poverty. <clears throat> I have to apologize again. This is so embarrassing. We're going to make it through. So true, bodies had been found in Dr. Knox's basement. And true, his name had been linked with Burke and Hare. And that was enough for the public legally just how the bodies actually found their way into Knox's basement was never proven but it did not matter public demanded its prey <laughs> the public was even encouraged by some of the clergy and the definitely hostile press to bring Dr. Knox down however 
things with this ghoulish business were about to get even more heated. It would happen 3,000 miles away from London in the Little Ohio River Hamlet of North Bend, Ohio. One last interesting note to this very day in Scotland, the term burking means grave robbing. Taking some cough syrup. See if that helps me. Okay. So it was only a matter of time that the profession of grave robbing would reach the United States. In fact, no one knows precisely when it all began here at home, but what is certain is that the grave robbers in the United States were as imaginative and crafty and prolific as anywhere in Europe. The difference in this country as compared to Burke and Hare come down to two things. First of all, the grave robbers in the U.S. stole the wrong body. And second of all, because of that, positive beneficial legislation came from what would be called the Harrison Horror. Today, the name Harrison is not prominent in American culture. However, in the 19th century, the name Harrison commanded great respect and power. One particular Harrison, John Scott, whose photograph is seen here in the center, was the only person in American history who was the son of one president and the father of another American president. <laughs> to your left is John Scott's father, the ninth president, William Henry Harrison. And to your right is John Scott's son, Benjamin Harrison, who became the 23rd president. In 1878, John Scott Harrison died at his home in North Bend, Ohio. And the rest, as they say, is history. On the day of John Scott's funeral, the mourners noticed that one particular grave in the cemetery appeared as if it had been disturbed. On closer examination, and to everyone's horror, it was determined that the dead body, John Scott's own nephew, named August Devon, had indeed been stolen. John Scott Harrison was buried that day, but his son, Benjamin, hired a watch guard, bricked up the grave, placed concrete slabs over the grave, his father's grave, and felt confident that nothing would happen. He returned that evening to Indianapolis. The next day, the Harrison family traveled the 16 miles to Cincinnati to search for the missing body of the Harrison's nephew, August Devon. <clears throat> the Harrisons hired a detective, and they started searching the different medical schools. The search eventually ended up at the Ohio Medical College. Once inside, a detailed search was made, and no August Devon could be found. At last, after the building had been thoroughly searched, the detective noticed a top rope attached to a pulley in a chute which led to a back alley. The detective ordered the janitor to pull up whatever was dangling from the rope at the bottom of the chute. At last, there emerged into the light what was clearly a body. <coughs> the body appeared to be a very old man. One of the Harrisons declared that they were looking for a young man. But with that, the detective removed a cloth which was covering the dead man's face to the utter shock and horror of the Harrisons. The old man dangling from the rope was none other than their own father, John Scott Harrison, who had just been buried the afternoon before. Imagine this happening in today's world. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So they didn't find the nephew, but they found his father. So this is kind of a layout of what this loading area in the Ohio Medical College looked like. So the grave robbers had broken through the concrete slabs the brick enclosure, and the watchman had left his post. Maybe he was paid off. Nowhere to be found. Next, the grave robbers brought the body of John Scott Harrison into Cincinnati and in the middle of the night pulled up to the back of the medical college, dropped the body down a trap door on the back alley, that's letter D on the screen. The body slid down the chute, letter C, 
and was connected to the pulley by the janitor of the skull at letter P. Then the body was hidden from view by hoisting up the body part way up the shaft at letter H. So they had a whole system worked out. So old Cunny and his son, father, son, business. No one ever really knew who robbed the grave of John Scott Harrison, but it was widely thought that it was the work of a nasty Cincinnati man known only by his alias, Old Cunny, and or Dr. Morton. It was also widely known in the lower circles of Cincinnati that Old Cunny's son was his accomplice. Old Cunny had a unique way of robbing graves. He would not dig up the actual grave, but would instead take an auger and drill down at an angle to the head of the casket. <clears throat> then he would have his small son crawl down to the casket lid, crack it open, tie a rope around the head of the corpse, and then pull the corpse out through the small hole. Sometimes it was never noticed by anyone that the grave had even been robbed. One group that has studied cemeteries estimates that in the old cemeteries in this country, many graves to this very day have been empty for years without anyone realizing. And they were emptied by the resurrectionists. So <clears throat> the Harrison family contacted the Estep and Meyer undertakers in Cincinnati to take care of their father's remains. The undertakers were sworn to silence, which they respected to the letter. The body of John Scott Harrison was placed in the John Strader Mausoleum under security and lock and key at Spring Grove Cemetery until arrangements could be made to have him once again properly buried in his family plot back home in North Bend, Ohio. So this is an early vault patent. So to everyone here in Connecticut, if you don't know, you'll know now. 95% of the cemeteries in Connecticut require these vaults, or they call them grave liners sometimes if they're not sealed. The cemetery will tell you it's to preserve the cemetery ground as part of perpetual care. But the original patent back here in 1878 was, in fact, to prevent grave robbing. So members of the faculty of the Ohio Medical School were arrested, and there was a public outcry. But the end of the legal outcome of the Harrison horror is lost forever, for all the records concerning the case were destroyed when the Hamilton County Courthouse was burned to the ground during the riot of 1886. However, one thing is for sure— for when the body snatchers took the body of a prominent Harrison, they had picked the wrong family. From this incident, it was clear that dead bodies required more protection than had ever been thought necessary in the past. And in 1878, a Cincinnati man named Andrew Van Bibber invented the first burial vault, which sealed and locked, as you can see in his patent sketch in this image. Van Bibber received his patent in 1878, and the burial vault is still widely used to this day. One last item to share. The body of August Devon was eventually discovered. They found his body at the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor. It was later, it was later discovered that Devon's remains were shipped from Cincinnati to Ann Arbor in a wooden shipping barrel by American Express So this is gross anatomy lab from the 19th century and then in the 21st century. So you could see how things have changed. So the second positive that came from the Harrison horror was that in 1879, the legislature in the state of Ohio passed firm laws making grave robbing a serious crime, punishable by prison and stiff fines. Also, because of pressure from future President Benjamin Harrison, the state legislatures in both Ohio and Indiana, Indiana passed the first laws which made it legal for a person to donate their body to any accredited medical school. 
In time, this pioneering legislation became the foundation for the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which is still widely used today. So, in the end, from the Harrison Horror came both the Protective Burial Vault and state legislation, which made it possible for people to legally donate their their bodies to medical colleges, and these two events basically eliminated the need and services of grave robbers altogether. Although as late as the 1970s, the body of Charlie Chaplin was stolen from its grave in Europe and ransomed to the family for thousands of dollars. Chaplin's remains were recovered and quickly reburied in a ceiling protective burial vault. So started as anatomy and studies and then I think later definitely turned more towards trying to get ransoms or maybe jewelry off of prominently buried people but this is now the gross anatomy labs of the 21st century not as dark or behind closed doors as it used to be but I hope that you have all found this journey into history interesting The Harrison horror basically spellbound the entire nation when it happened. However, through such a terrible incident emerged two positives, which we enjoy today, the Protective Burial Vault and the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. The medical and embalming professions were compelled to deal with grave robbers for a time. It was the only way to get practice in the art and science of anatomy and embalming. It was a curious relationship, the union of two highly respected professionals professions, medicine and funeral service, with that of probably one of the lowest forms of human life imaginable, body snatchers. Body snatching, grave robbing, or resurrectionist were nothing new in history. For the epitaph on the grave of none other than William Shakespeare in part reads, good friends for Jesus sake forbear to dig the dirt enclosed here. Alert be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. The terrible, cynical writer and pundit Ambrose Bierce in his Devil's Dictionary probably gives one of the best definitions of the body snatcher. Body snatcher, noun, a robber of graves, one who supplies the young physicians with that which the old physician has supplied the old undertaker. Many thanks again for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions at this time.